Welcome back. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee, um, continuing our morning discussion on um, uh, race data and traffic stops. And uh, it is time now to check in with the Criminal Justice Council. And we have with us uh, Christopher Brickell, who is the Deputy Director of the Council. And uh, welcome, Christopher. And uh, just to help orient folks who may be new to this area of policy, if you could uh, just give us an overview on uh, what the Council's uh, chief duties are, and then any comments you have in particular around uh, the issue of data collection. Oh, we are having trouble hearing you. You seem to be unmuted. However, maybe the there's a challenge on your end. Uh, nope, can't hear you. So what I'm gonna recommend is that you leave the meeting and then rejoin on that same link and uh, keep an eye out for a dialogue box that asks you to join by um, Wi-Fi audio. Maybe that'll help. So stand by committee. That, that about exceeds my capacity to do um, IT support. So hopefully this works. That's the only, that's the only thing that I can think of. <laughs> Now did he lose the link and doesn't know where to find it to come back in? Here we go. He is joining again and fingers crossed um, the audio connects this time. And, oh, okay. We've got help on the way. Uh, I'm trying to help you now. Excellent. Right. We have audio coming from you all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> all right. Welcome, and uh, thank you for your quick work in, in getting that uncovered. Sorry to, sorry to hold the committee up, but uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for having me here today. Um, for those in the committee who uh, don't know me, my name is Christopher Burkell. Feel free to call me Chris. That's what I go by. Um, I am seven days the Deputy Director at the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. So bear that in mind as questions you pose to me may not be answered fully to the, um, the information that you would like. Um, I have been prior to my position here, I have been 36 years in law enforcement and I listen intently to the conversations that you've had earlier, um, the discussions and the questions and find them all very intriguing and have been dealing with them for a number of years myself. And uh, I've also had the, the pleasure of serving as the law enforcement liaison on the racial equity task force. So I know that this work is important to everybody and know that it's, it's critical that Law enforcement gets it right, data is collected properly, and training is done around all these issues. So having said that, uh, Director Simons, one, is, is ill, but two, is in the council meeting currently and asked that I um, express her interest and desire to speak to the committee uh, specifically to training and training initiatives. And um, so I will just go on and just kind of give you a brief overview of um, some of the issues that but I don't want to say issues that I see, but some of the things that um, happen here at the at the council, which is um, what what does happen here is that we house the data that's provided to law enforcement. We do not extract it. We house it here and we make it publicly available. 
Um, that data is collected by law enforcement uh, and reported by September of every year. And then it's posted on this website. It used to be through a contract with CRG, the Crime Research Group, and is now hosted, uh, it, it's now with a contract with NPF, which is the National Police Foundation. Um, we do have our own fair and impartial policing uh, curriculum here. Um, most uh, Captain Kessler and, and Aton are, are intimately familiar with that as well. Um, they're also doing fantastic work and working in concert with us, which helps us. And so some of the things that we're looking for really at this point is to um, try to identify problems in the collection and challenges in the practice and support identification and training so that we can improve policies and processes for data uh, stop traffic collection. And in addition to that, um, we're looking for a way to implement any new requirements that may come from the legislature, um, as well as assisting Vermont law enforcement agencies in collecting that data and making it, making it publicly available. Um, having said that, some of the goals that we're gonna be working forward with the National Police Foundation is we're going to look at the different stages of traffic stops, um, and that includes the decision to stop, and whether citations are issued, searches and arrests. We're gonna look at recommendations for strategies to improve the collection and analysis of, and reporting of traffic stops. And I, I wanna just pause for one second to remind everybody that we house the data and have um, quantitative data. We do not have qualitative data. We do not assess that. Uh, we don't have the resources to assess that or the expertise to um, analyze that data. So those are some of the issues that we face here. And then we're also gonna be working um, to push the data that we provide on our website to make it more uh, friendly and have an open data portable um, as Dr. Seguino had talked about earlier, earlier with uh, Burlington PD doing something similar. Um, we're going to be working towards that, so I don't have a model or, or something to give you as a visual what that will look like. But I do know that sometimes data is confusing to look at, and the data that we post on here, unless you really know what it is that you're looking for or what you're looking to compare, it's just data. It doesn't really help you uh, to, turn, to, to really determine what's going on in law enforcement, what they're doing right, what they're doing not so good and ways to improve what we all want to see is the relationship between law enforcement and the public and not inserting police where they don't need to be, but um, still allowing them to do their job and, and, and do it effectively. And I think lastly, um, really some of the other, one of the other goals that we're looking for is to um, produce some recommendations for policies and procedures and practices for training and conducting fair and impartial uh, policing stops. So the, the better that we can do our job of training law enforcement and how to do that work um, is going to assist when I hear these conversations about VSP does it really well, and they do. They do have the resources. They do have the ability to get their entire staff and train. The rest of Vermont law enforcement does what they can on their own. They send people here when they can. And when we're able to provide the training, scheduling sometimes is problematic for them. But that's one of the one of the um, charges that I've been given coming here is how we're going to make these deliverables that we provide to Vermont law enforcement better services to them because they are our customer. So in brief, that's kind of where I'm at and what I can um, outline for you. But I'm happy to answer answer any specific questions that you may have. And or I will deflect to Director Simons if it's something that uh, is specific to individual training that you would like to discuss. Questions from committee members. <laughs> Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Chris, for being here today and welcome to your new position. Um, I was hoping to have um, your wish list 
um, from what you just presented to us. If we could get that somehow typed and sent to us or uploaded to our website. Um, and I'm gonna ask that for everybody that's presented besides the ones that we have, uh, just to do a little side-by-side -side to see where everybody's asking and where we could try to find a, uh, yeah, a similarity, sorry, between what people are asking for and what we can try to group together. Um, I, I appreciate you uh, giving us that information. And uh, if, you, if we could just get that in writing, if it's not already there. Thank you. Absolutely, I can do that. Representative Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Chris, for testifying this morning. Um, so um, obviously I was very embarrassed by the Wilmington Police Department's um, uh, COVID traffic stop data with the increases um, in overall traffic stops and, and those of people of color. Um, I, I went on to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council's training site and tried to look into the, to get more data on Wilmington Police Department and I found it extremely difficult um, to get that data. Um, and, you know, I'm in a lucky position. I'm both a state representative for, for Wilmington as well as a select board member. Um, but, you know, as a, a volunteer select board member, I, I did, I think it would be very challenging for anyone to go in there and find information on their, on their police department. Um, is there any effort underway to make that data um, more easily accessible um, to local police departments? We can only provide you with what agencies provide us and with what they're required to send us. I, I hear a lot of conversations um, going on in this committee about what other information is gathered? What else could we get? What else would be beneficial for the public to know? And there's a lot of information on a traffic stop and that can be collected and is collected. Um, and I have, I have heard um, anecdotally, some of the conversations that I've heard going on in your committee this morning about the fact that law enforcement collects a lot of data, but they only report what they're required to report. I, I wish I had a better answer for that because reporting is reporting. Uh, if it's if we record it and it's publicly available, we should be making it publicly available to anybody that wants to have it. Um, I think it's just perhaps in the wording or the direction um, that's given to law enforcement as to how that data should be extracted and provided to the academy. It's having done this myself, it's um, when you're not familiar, familiar with extracting data, it can be challenging and especially for smaller agencies that are relying on possibly one person or an admin person to do that. But one of the things that I found by extracting my own data when I was reporting traffic stop was that Lo and behold, I found um, missing data that was not on there that my officers were supposed to be recording. And it wasn't intentional data. It was things that they either left out because they were not, they were reporting it sometimes on multiple traffic stops, which was not the way that they were supposed to be doing it, or they were sometimes reporting it and on one, but then not on another or sometimes just leaving it blank because it was a box they forgot to check. Um, all those are things that are the responsibilities of an agency head and or whoever is reviewing their work and their data, no different than it is to review an officer's body camera video and find out how they're interacting with the public that they serve. Um, it's, it's a responsibility of the agency. I know that that's pushed out to agencies and I know that that's pushed out in training how to make that work better, I'm not real clear on the answer for that. Um, just, just to follow up on that, I, I mean, I, I did find it very discouraging as a, a, a select board member that, well, I, I see that the data is there and I'm not complaining about what data is being collected versus what's not being collected. I'm just, you know, for a select board member who, you know, I think it's going to be very challenging to go into um, the data that's on the Vermont Criminal Justice Council's website and, and try to extract the data for their individual town. And I think as um, Dr. Aitan Nazrid Longo suggested, it is posting the information so that it is easily accessible on a town by town basis would, would be really helpful. Um, because just frankly, a, a select board member is not gonna take hours to, to go through the data. Um, maybe our police chief will, but you know, oft, often that information is not shared with the select board. Um, and I do believe that it's very important, you know, that public citizens, especially as represented by their select boards, can easily access the data. 
I don't disagree with you one bit. And that's, as I said earlier, that's one of the projects we'll be working on with National Police Foundation is that how do we create that dashboard that makes this data not only more easily readable, um, but actually provides an analysis that people can look at and see what it is that they're actually reading and, and understanding it. Um, help me understand sort of the time frame of that project um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, taking a look around, seeing what other states are doing and getting a, a more user-friendly dashboard up and running. So again, seven days in and not wanting to box myself into a, a corner. Um, I have not personally had any conversations yet with NPF where there is a scheduled meeting for later this month with them. Um, they are required monthly by their contract as I'm reading um, to report to us and give us updates as to what data is being worked on and how we accomplish those goals. So I will be making sure that I hold them to that contract. Um, so my hope is that in, in some of the initial conversations that that is a, a, a major focal point for them to make them understand that we're responsible for providing that data to the state and for it being accessible to the people that need to read it. Not just the data, but make it widely available so that people can understand it. And I, I honestly don't have a time frame for that, but I can certainly get one in our first meeting. I think that would be very helpful to understand. Um, any other questions from committee members? Rep Behovsky. Thank you. I know we're largely talking about traffic stop data and I know that the Criminal Justice Council has a larger purview and I'm, I'm wondering if there is any data looking into other aspects or where there is data expansion happening. One thing I'm specifically thinking about is complaint data for our citizen complaints. That is housed here. That is publicly available at, at any agency. Um, I can, uh, I can't speak specifically about that type of thing only because there are many types of complaints that come in that don't reach the level of a formal complaint. Um, we do accept complaints here of unprofessional conduct. They are investigated here. So um, any complaints like that we could give statistics on numbers of how many of those are received here. Um, I could get those from Director Simons for you if that would be helpful. But typically complaints about law enforcement agencies or practices um, or even collection of data would go directly to those agencies and they should be able to report that out. Better speaking for, for the state of Vermont for having a central location for them to be able to get that data, that's something that I suppose your committee could look at about having us being the, uh, the houser of that information as well, but then getting that information out to the general public about this is an entity that that can be made or how, how does that happen? Because most people wanna have that personal connection with their agency when they have an issue. They wanna reach out to those people directly. So that, that might be difficult to make happen, but at least as far as um, complaints regarding unprofessional conduct of law enforcement, we could certainly provide those numbers. And um, is there currently any demographic data collected with those kinds of things, who's making the complaint, what the instance was, any, anything like that, or is it simply the number of complaints that were made? It would simply be a number because there, keep in mind that there is not a, um, there's not a database here that the Academy use, such, such as Valcor or Spillman. There, there's not a CAD system that gets, complaints are not made and generated here, so that type of data isn't collected. Um, that's not to say that it couldn't be uh, garnered from law enforcement agencies. They would likely have to determine best how to do that, but the, answer, the short answer is no, that information is not available here. Great, thank you. Questions from committee members. Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Christopher, today for testifying. Uh, we heard earlier in uh, testimony this morning 
that um, an important approach in training is to understand the history of policing. Um, as you may well know, the institution of policing was created to um, control enslaved Africans, to retrieve them when they were seeking their freedom and so forth. So how um, is the academy uh, using history as a, as a learning tool for, for candidates? So that is an excellent question. One of, the, uh, one of the criteria that I discussed when even applying for this position was something that I felt was lacking was the uh, institutional knowledge of policing, why it was developed, how it started, how we got to where we're at. Uh, that, without law enforcement officers at the basic level being trained about how we got to become law enforcement officers, how can they even appreciate the disparities that have happened over eons to, to, to other people and, and understand why law enforcement is looked at at times in a negative light because of their own actions. So um, that was one of the things that I wanted to uh, discuss very, very intently with our director of curriculum and see where we, one of the things, uh, not challenges I should say, is that um, what I have heard um, contextually and what I have heard in abstract is, and I've seen it happen, is um, how de-escalation de training happens here at the academy, how it's woven into scenarios. Um, what types of training do you do for fair and impartial policing? What should be accepted as training for fair and impartial policing? And while I can see it and, and, and I can watch it happening in scenarios, they can't articulate it. It, it has to be articulated by Direct, direct, direct curriculum, it has to be evaluated, there has to be measurables within that. And those are the things that I need to check into, again, being seven days in with our curriculum director and see where that's woven in and if it's not there, why it's not and how we get it in there. Uh, especially, where we know that there are plenty of people in law enforcement that have been in law enforcement for years who, who grew up in a different training time. Uh, they're not, they were not um, introduced to a lot of these topics and some are resistant to and some should probably no longer be in law enforcement. So how do we reach all of those people? We start by teaching that at the basic level and then we really need to push that out into the culture of agencies because while they can get great training here and they can be taught ethics and how to treat people equitably, once they leave here, they're going to the culture of their department and that's where the rest of their career takes shape or unravels. And that's where the, the negative impacts happen. They're not caused here, but this institution should be a um, major component in making sure that that basic academy curriculum that they get here continues on throughout their career and is reinforced to make sure that that follows out throughout their career. Thank so again, you. I'm sorry, uh, it's not a, a not a great answer yep. for you because I don't have it. That's one of the one of the very first things when our um, when our director is back from COVID related issues, uh, we'll be having those discussions as well. Thanks, and all the best to you in your new position. Thank you. So, Chris, thank you for articulating um, sort of the hope that in changing uh, the, the training for new officers um, that we can affect uh, a change over time. Um, my worry with, with putting our hope in that scenario is that, you know, law enforcement tends to be a, you know, a top-down command and, um, you know, model. And uh, we could do all of the best work with the best intentions of, um, of bringing in recruits and, uh, and training them in ways uh, that we think make sense. And we could send them out to law enforcement agencies where they're reporting to people who they can't influence, <laughs> even with maybe their broader worldview or deeper understanding of, um, you know, some of the 
uh, cultural um, pressures that uh, that have caused uh, bias to persist in policing. So, how do we how do we affect that change in a way that doesn't um, make the profession of policing so frustrating for people who are new to it and who get it and who really strive to have you know law enforcement be um, uh, more responsive to the needs of their community? Another excellent question. And I think first, first we start with the easy low hanging fruit, which is make sure that our curriculum here is relevant and that we get it to all basic recruits that start here, young, impressionable men and women that are going to be responsible for doing the day-to-day -day work of interacting with the public. I think we also need to develop a, a mid-level or, or supervisory training for um, supervisors that are going to be directly responsible for those recruits once they get out. And then uh, you know, a chief sheriff's managerial type of training as well about culture and about understanding where they are in the profession and where the profession is going and making sure that they're on the same track that the profession is going. And if not, making them understand that too, uh, so that, that that could be changed or maybe thinking of, of another career. Um, you know, this is really, this is too important uh, a topic for, for not just law enforcement, and just, just for, for humans to, to be able to interact with each other and, and get along. And it's, I, I've learned an enormous amount uh, and gained a lot of respect for people having spent the brief time and a little, little over a year on the racial equity task force and had my eyes and ears open to conversations that I thought I was aware of and found that I was not. Um, and I, I can't thank those people enough for that. And there are a lot of those same conversations that go on here at the academy with the staff. It's a, it's a matter of getting the best developed programs and having them be evidence-based and for us to be able to measure the work that we're doing and know that what we're doing is working towards that right goal and, and being able to justify it and, and look you in the eye and say, we're doing it and we're doing it right. And with help from people like Ethan and a numerous amounts of people, um, we're working to get that right. And as I heard him say earlier, this is a process. It doesn't happen with a directive that comes from the legislature that this is now mandated training that you have to have. We have to develop that training. We have to make it happen and we have, we have to do it right. I mean, we can't, we can't afford to do it wrong. Thank you. Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chris. Uh, I, uh, I, I, because of the multi-model that Vermont accepts for policing, that is to say, we have sheriffs, we have small departments, we have no departments, we have BSB, uh, training appears to be one of the foundational or common, if you will, experiences. And, and I guess one question uh, is how do we get them in the door? Um, that is to say, the folks who have been out in the field for many moons, um, is there something the legislature could do as an incentive to make sure uh, that particularly in a, in a small department, which probably is shorthanded in the best of circumstances, somehow they still are able to cycle people through on a predictable periodic basis because we have a back backstop for them. Either it's the VSB or it's loaned uh, personnel from somewhere else. Uh, because I think unless the state is going to take a much more dictatorial role over departments as it does over the VSB, uh, I don't see where we go other than making sure that everybody in those uh, autonomous departments is cycled through regularly and is subject to retraining and in some sense, uh, evaluation. Uh, so, you know, how do we get them in the door, I guess, is, is, the, is the, the short takeaway on that. Is it financial incentives? Is it certification that somehow evaporates uh, unless people 
don't cycle through. Where can we go with this other than just, as Madam Chair said, focus on the people who are just entering the profession, which will take a generation at least. Thanks. No, thank you, and I, I appreciate the question. Um, I think I think we're doing some of that, and you are doing some of that um, through mandates of training that officers must receive. So now there's fair and impartial policing that is mandated that they have to take. We have a contracted trainer who is going throughout the state to make that, in fact, happen, to reach agencies that either are short-staffed, can't... Um, you know, during COVID times, I mean, I just, I just left an agency that is trying extremely hard just to function because of staffing levels and trying to do the job that their town government wants them to do, and yet still keep up with mandated training that then puts at risk their certification. I think, I think that's one of the best ways is um, really in mandated training and making sure that that training is done. And as you have already done and we've already implemented, people that fail to keep up with certain mandates no longer have access to the academy. They don't have access to training. They don't have the access to the range here. There are things that they can't access in order to keep their certification. We want to be partners with law enforcement. We don't really want to be the coming down on you. You can't use us. You can't come here for training. But that is a reality of keeping people accountable. The, the best way, and, and I know that I'm sure that you are very tired of hearing the word resources because resources means money. That's what it, that's really what it means. But you, you have to, you have to re remind yourselves that this institution here, the, the Academy and the Criminal Justice Council is a very small group of people responsible for training everybody in this state minus VSP, although we do do training for VSP as well. And so there are struggles with that when you have three training coordinators who are responsible for basic training classes that come through, level two training classes that come through, and in-service training. And you have one director of curriculum and development and one director of administration. They rely, in reality, on a lot of volunteer instructors that come in here and, and teach subjects that they are subject matter experts in, but fair and impartial policing, racial data is not among those groups. These are two important topics that really need the focus. So the staffing is what needs to be a little bit easier to manage here so that we have the resources to push out to those members that are in the community, in the law enforcement community, that we are sure that they're all getting the same training and that we are sure they've all had it and that they're up to date on their certification. And that somebody's checking into their certifications and their training to make sure that they're appropriate and adequate and they're, they're justified. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm learning over a very short period of time that this institution is responsible for, but can't do because it, it doesn't have the resources to do it. So. Regardless, there are things that we're going to do because we have to and we're mandated to, and we need to do a better job of that. But I cannot emphasize strongly enough that resources are what is needed here. And I, I know that there's already topics uh, later today, perhaps even in this committee about resources and, and allocations of funding, um, which I, I will let Director Simons address with you. But um, the short answer is, I think the responsibility is on us as a training institution, not just the basic training to new recruits, but to everybody in law enforcement throughout their career to make sure that these are fundamental topics that they're being trained on. And whether they come here or we have to go to them, that they get it. I, I hope that answers slightly your question. Representative Bihovsky. Thank you. Um, we are talking a lot about training and I agree that that is really important. And even before that, I think we need to talk about recruitment and who is doing this work and who are we asking to do this work. And so, um, you know, back to the data, are we looking at who's being recruited, where they're being recruited from and, and considering changing recruitment processes to ensure that we're diversifying and broadening who is doing this work? We heard earlier that one of the challenges to making police officer data 
that gives us demographic data anonymized is that there are so few police officers of color. So what are we doing in, in at the recruitment process to really think about who are we asking to do this work? Uh, from the Criminal Justice Council's perspective, we are not doing anything to that to that end. That is not only the wish, but the the responsibility of the agencies hiring people and where the recruitment efforts go, um, what they want for reflections of the communities that they serve. And I, I know that they struggle. I mean, I, I, I hear the conversations constantly about we need to bring in diverse populations to our state to just to be able to thrive and to be able to uh, continue living in this state. If we want more people, we need, we need a lot more people here. And how do we best do that? Law enforcement would be much better served if we had a, a, a more diverse population among us. Um, the unfortunate part is the academy is not part of the recruiting process. The agencies that send them here are, and I think it, I almost think it would be an imposition of us to impose how those efforts take place when, as you earlier stated, municipalities, local sheriffs, they all have their own desire of what they want to see for law enforcement, for the communities that they serve. So what their needs are and what their wants are, are really relative of what their membership should look like. And I, I know that that is a struggle for um, getting diverse populations into law enforcement. Representative Hooper. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, Chris. Uh, we're talking about specifically sort of police departments, uh, some of which are really small. Uh, in the state, though, we have LEOs that are part of the still sworn officers, and I assume carry the same expectations that are at DMV, the fish cops, liquor, even down to the people that inspect beauty parlors, some of those in the Secretary of State's office are sworn officers. To your knowledge, and I, I realize that the uh, statistical people are gone, are they included in this representation of who's doing what uh, around the state in terms of uh, our, our reporting on fair and equitable and all the other aspects? Do you have any idea of that? And when you bring people in the subgroups, so to speak, in for training, is it any different uh, when you get a fish and game person or a DMV person than you would with somebody from the sheriff's or the state police or anywhere else? The very direct answer to that is yes and no. Um, so let me let me put it this way. That pretty much as far covers. as mandated training goes, uh, anybody that has a law enforcement certification that exercises law enforcement powers is responsible for the mandated training. So that would be pushed out. That training would be the same to every law enforcement officer that is required to take it. Having said that, some sworn law enforcement officers don't do the duties of a regular police officer. So sworn officers through the Secretary of State's office don't perform the same functions or interact with the general public the same way a patrol officer does. Somebody that is a sworn law enforcement officer for fish and game or fish and wildlife does not interact with the general public as much as somebody that's working in a sheriff's department doing a patrol. Um, so that's why the answer is yes and no. For mandated training and for certification purposes, yes, if you are a sworn law enforcement officer, you, unless, unless otherwise not required by a legislative mandate to take it, would have to have the fair and impartial policing training. Domestic violence training, another, another area. Um, you know, our, our Department of Motor Vehicle inspectors who have law enforcement authority going to deal with domestic violence as much as somebody who is working in a local police department. No, they may not at all in their career, but th those are still some mandated training. So we have some trainings that while mandated may not be applicable to the people that are getting them or may not be useful and, and they can't be tailored, so to speak, to meet those very specific needs of individual agencies, but they can be tailored 
to meet the majority of law enforcement that does interact with our traveling public and with the residents of this state on a regular basis. And that's important that we get that out there as well. Um, I, I hope that answers your question somewhat. Well, yes and no was a pretty broad start. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, uh, any other questions from committee members? All right, before we shift and talk a little bit about resources, I wanted to, um, to just put an idea out in front of the committee and in front of uh, folks who might be following along um, on this committee testimony this morning. Um, I think it's important that we take a look at what data we're collecting and whether that data is, um, is uh, entirely useful or if there are gaps that we think we would like to fill. Um, I understand the rationale of not shifting uh, too frequently what data points we are uh, collecting information on because it makes it harder to um, to assess trends over time if you're collecting different data. Um, but uh, it seems to me that uh, this is a, a moment in time where, uh, where an assessment of, of whether we're correcting, collecting the correct data um, might make sense um, as we work on also making sure that that data is out there and accessible as Rep Gannon said to the local government officials who are who are supervising their own uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, in an ordinary time, uh, if we were meeting at the state house, I would, you know, ask for one or two committee members, preferably, preferably two, to uh, to take on um, this project and perhaps, you know, invite the correct folks to come together around a cafeteria table and have a conversation about this. Um, uh, this remote meeting um, and COVID safety concerns certainly make that harder to do. Um, but nonetheless, I'd like to put that um, question to the committee um, and ask you to get back to me if you would like to be part of a duo of committee members who would reach out to appropriate folks uh, who might have thoughts on, uh, on data points and, uh, and, and have a virtual uh, cafeteria conversation and uh, and perhaps propose uh, making some changes to this. So um, I don't need an answer right this moment, but if you want to be captain or co-captain of that project, um, uh, let's talk. Uh, so Chris, thank you. I have um, I have to shift gears now and uh, and really want to talk a bit about resources. Um, 